So we welcome you all to this special edition of the CPAN Kankai meeting. We want to start the meeting by committing the meeting to the hand of God with the individual silence prayer for environment. Can we pray individually for environment, please? Um, so in our, in our midst today, we welcome and recognize our chairman, CPAN, Dr. Joseph Madu, for the executive committee, all our lecturers and teachers, our mentors and our headers, and all the participants we will recognize and welcome you. Our speakers, Dr. Nusrat Bello and Dr. Agwini Andrew, we welcome you all to this meeting. The topic we are looking at today is titled An Overview of the Concept of Evidence-Based Medicine in Patient Care in Clinical, pharmacy, in clinical Practice. And to deal with that topic is Number one, Dr. Nisha Tubelo, a United Kingdom based clinical pharmacist, and Dr. Agbeni Andrew, a deputy director with the Department of Pharmacy, UCTH, Cosiva State. To start the meeting is Dr. Nisha Tubelo. Each speaker will spend 30 minutes. And at the end of the presentation, there will be room for questions and answers and contributions. And that will follow by Thank you very much for taking your time to be here this night. It's a great honor to be given this platform um, to share some of okay. okay, so uh, once more, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here this night. Um, I know it's uh, been a very long day, so I'll try as much as possible not to take so much of our time. I'll risk through um, some of the basics and hopefully we can get through some of the um, um, important um, aspects before the end of the night. Um, so let me use this opportunity to appreciate um, the professors and our elders amongst us this night. Um, so um, the topic, um, like the moderator has said, is an overview of the concept of evidence-based medicine in patient care in clinical practice. Um, can I just say before I go on that um, I have no in um, conflict of interest with any evidence-based organizations or body or individual, and whatever the presentation, um, uh, the context of the presentation tonight is, is based on my own personal understanding and some of my own experiences. So I will welcome any corrections and any recommendations at the end of the presentation. So for the agenda of the presentation tonight, um, it's as stated um, as follows. Um, so the abbreviation, some of the common abbreviations will uh, be included at the beginning of the slides. And then um, the objectives of the presentation, the, um, what we hope to achieve at the end of the presentation. Um, the reason for why we thought that this presentation was um, relevant to present um, uh, discourse in pharmacy practice, especially. And then before going on to the concept of evidence-based medicine itself in patient care in clinical practice, and we'll round up with a conclusion of some key points. Dr. Adbeni will be co-presenting with me and he will um, come on at the appropriate time later on. So um, going on to the objectives of the presentation, um, basically what we hope... So, uh, the goals of the presentation tonight is, Better now. Right, is to enhance our understanding and also um, help us appreciate what evidence-based medicine practice in clinical decision making in patient care in clinical practice. Hopefully, we'll be able to achieve this aims with the following objectives by highlighting the meaning and importance of evidence-based medicine, elucidating the process of evidence-based medicine, the role and process of searching and appraisal of research evidence, and also we'll um, round up by reflecting on the role of evidence-based medicine in pharmacy practice. Right, so why did we think this um, 
topic was necessary at this time. Um, there were quite a few reasons, but I'm just going to highlight some of the few. Um, Evidence-based medicine practice is not a new um, model or a new concept to most of us here. Um, and why it's so is because of the importance of the concept. Um, the concept came into existence just about um, 30 years ago, so it's kind of uh, relatively novel, but it has really transformed medical practice uh, exceptionally that um, it's work that we as pharmacists or clinicians talk about it and ensure appropriate uh, practice of evidence-based medicine practice. In fact, it's so, um, become so important that um, a, a, a poll about 10 years ago rated it as um, six of the most important milestones in medical practice. So if evidence-based medicine practice is so important, then it is appropriate that we have a good understanding of the concepts. Um, because like the literature cites, um, despite the importance of evidence-based medicine and despite the fact that it's made so much impact, there's still a misunderstanding about the concept, there's still a lack of knowledge and lack of understanding of what the components are. And you must agree with me that if you don't have a good understanding of anything, it is difficult for you to be able to apply it appropriately. And also, because of the level of information, the level of medical information we have out there today, in fact, um, uh, the level of information that we, um, we are having today, I'm sure is nothing um, comparable to what they had in 20 years ago. And that was actually one of the reasons why evidence-based medicine came into existence. It was to focus some of this um, left, um, outpour of information from medical literature. So if you can imagine if that was a reason 20 years ago, what, um, how important evidence-based medicine would be now to our own practice. Also, um, there are reasons to believe that clinicians or clinicians or healthcare practitioners involved in the care of the patients are lacking in the skills, the required skills to be able to carry out evidence-based medicine effectively. There are also reasons to believe that despite the importance of um, evidence-based medicine, specifically research evidence, there's reason to believe that uh, clinicians may not be incorporating evidence in practice. And um, the patient, whatever we do as healthcare professionals or as clinicians, whatever we do, if the patients are not willing to oblige, then it's not no use. So it's important that we have the patients on board. But um, evidence or the literature says that um, uh, in practice, uh, some clinicians or practitioners do not really think that, do not agree with the fact that uh, patients should be involved in, um, in their own care. So we'll see how that can impact on outcomes of patients later on. And also, uh, based on the fact that um, our level of expertise as clinicians vary, uh, it is important that we keep on having um, trainings, we keep on being enlightened about um, what evidence-based medicine is. And like we said, of course, because of the clinical role of pharmacists is expanding, so it's important for pharmacists to be able to have a good grasp of what evidence-based medicine is. So in order for us to appreciate further, in order for us to appreciate further what um, evidence-based medicine is and the impact it has made in patient care over the last 30 years, um, it's important we look at briefly how medicine has been practiced in the past. Um, so let's go on to the origin and evolution of evidence-based medicine. So before the um, establishment of evidence-based medicine, it was believed that mostly um, medical practice de decisions or interventions were strictly being made based on expert opinions, 
uh, based on anecdotal reports. So even at that time, the level of research practice, um, although it was not of high quality, it was really not even implemented into medical practice. And so, although some, phys uh, some clinicians did try to resist, however, um, it was quite a difficult period. And over the course of time, the same thing went on. Interventions were being based mainly on opinions. They were be being based mainly on what the authorities said. And this continued for centuries. However, the quality of research practice did begin to improve about two, 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 two centuries ago. So the first controlled randomized trial did come up in 1747 based on the report I have. But despite that, despite the fact that um, we had a controlled trial about 200 centuries, I'm sorry, two centuries ago, it was not until the 20th century that there was any influence of um, having evidence-based medicine in clinical practice. And so there, uh, um, I've put out some of the um, important advances that happen in research practice, and we can have a look at them later on when we've got our, um, the spare time. So I'll just leave that for later uh, uh, because of the time we have in order not to take too much of our time. But I'd like to go further to highlight um, one very great um, influencer of evidence-based medicine who tried to change the practice. And this was happening in the 70s. So you can see that not far enough, uh, not long ago, there wasn't much of evidence-based medicine in actual clinical practice. So this great uh, influencer um, named um, 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 Archibald Cochrane, Professor Archibald Cochrane, sometimes he's referred to as the father of evidence-based medicine. So in 1972, he released a book, a, pub uh, a publication, which strongly criticized how uh, medical practice was being carried out at that time. In fact, he was able to identify that patients who were treated based on evidence had better outcomes than patients who were based, uh, treated based on expert opinion or without any evidence. So he had a, a um, he put out a great resistance about how evidence was being used in medical practice, and he insisted on the use of randomized control trials, especially to inform our decision making in clinical practice. However, this did not make any significant uh, change. Another person who tried to influence medical practice is David Eddy. He is not as popular as uh, Archibald Cochrane, but he also tried and he observed that um, a lot of practices were being carried out without adequate evidences. So I'll just uh, leave us to go through those extra information if we well interested. Uh, if it's of any interest to us late, later on. But I'll go on to who actually made the significant change, the, the important change of what we now recognize as evidence-based medicine today. He is uh, David Sackett, along with his two other colleagues, are now considered as the fathers of evidence-based medicine. And this movement to bring evidence-based medicine into practice actually started in 1981. But it was in 1992 that the name evidence-based medicine came up. This name came up initially as scientific medicine, but it was frowned upon, and then he later changed it to evidence-based medicine. And um, the reason why this movement started was also based on the lack of evidence in medical practice that was um, identified by these three um, clinical epidemiologists. 
and with what um, with their own experiences and what they had uh, reviewed from past literature this the three um, eminent um, clinical epidemiologists came up with a better construct of what evidence-based medicine was so what happened at this period was that although the idea of evidence-based medicine had been long existing in the past but there was nothing concrete until these three eminent professors were able to bring something together in the 80s so that is why evidence-based medicine has been considered as something very um, relatively new in medical practice and so the three professors brought together this concept of evidence-based medicine but then again when the title or the concept was named there was no practical um there was no practical suggestion or recommendation of how to go about it it was still quite vague and so they came up with um an initial meaning of evidence-based medicine which is what is quite popular still popular today so they defined evidence-based medicine as the consensus and ex um, consensus explicit and judicious use of current based evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients however this meaning did lack a bit of practicality and so they later came up with another more practical meaning of evidence-based medicine which is the second or along the first one are both the most popular meaning of evidence-based medicine today so the second meaning of evidence-based medicine which is very practical and which is used widely today is the integration of best research evidence with clinical practice and patient values and this has been referred to as the evidence-based medicine triad so that is how the name evidence-based medicine and the meaning of evidence-based medicine was formed and what's as as it is existing today so evidence-based medicine is now recognized as the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values so those three components make up the key aspect of evidence-based medicine today and the three components when put together appropriately it is expected that this would optimize clinical decision making in our practices and if clinical decisions are optimized it is um, expected that patient outcomes would be optimum and so with that happening um, evidence-based medicine began to gain its popularity and having its own influence on how decisions were made in clinical practice and so um, along the line though there of course like every other thing there are critics there are people who still didn't believe in the concept and there has been a lot of arguments and because the founders of evidence-based medicine also defined evidence-based medicine as the three-legged stool, they used an analogy that evidence-based medicine is a three-legged stool, whereby you have the clinical expertise, you have the patient's value, and the research evidence. And that without one component, the evidence, I mean, the evidence-based practice becomes unstable. However, some um, critics of evidence-based medicine argued that it, what this means is that if you don't have one component, maybe patient value, then that means you are not practicing evidence-based practice. However, that is contrary to what the founders of uh, evidence-based medicine, um, um, evidence medicine practice uh, recommended. So you, 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 you should have uh, clinical expertise, you should have patient value, and you should consider best evidence uh, research when you're practicing evidence-based medicine. But the probability that you have 
an equal contribution from each comp component is very unlikely. However, as clinicians or as healthcare practi practitioners involved in the care of, of patients, the most important thing is to try as much as possible to incorporate these three uh, components into practice in order to ensure that clinical decisions are optimum. And so, with evidence-based medicine being um, being um, being um, existing and es established, all the terminologies came along and has been confused along with evidence-based medicine practice today. And some of these terminologies as, uh, or terms, as some as some that I have highlighted on the slides today. So in order for us not to be confused about what evidence-based medicine practice is itself and what other, these other terms mean, I've tried to kind of um, distinguish between all these terms and the concept. So we also have what we call evidence-based practice today and evidence-based clinical practice. Both all the two terms are similar terms to evidence-based medicine. And so they have been used interchangeably. But we also have, uh, I'd like us to take note of what, um, uh, other terms like evidence-based therapy. Evidence-based therapy is quite different from evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based therapies are therapies that have been considered to meet up with minimum standard of the expected standard of um, experimental level that is supposed to guide those um, that is supposed to guide those treatments so evidence-based therapies uh, is when you practice when you use evidence-based uh, therapy that does not mean that you are practicing evidence-based medicine what it means is that uh, when you adopt evidence-based therapies it means you are adopting treatments that have met up to standard therapy but it doesn't mean that you're practicing evidence-based medicine so the only uh, way you can say you're practi practicing evidence-based medicine is when you incorporate the three components that have been listed on earlier on so um, uh, let's, um to highlight better on what each of the components is um, the best research evidence in evidence-based medicine um, was actually one of the main reasons why evidence-based medicine was established in the first place in order for practitioners to be able to incorporate um, evidence-based research in their practice and this has made a lot of important changes into how we practice today because with, um, by integrating the best research evidence that is available, uh, we're able to bridge the gap between knowledge and practice. So whatever new knowledge comes up, we're able to adopt in practice. And that is able, uh, that is able that allows us to be able to uh, reevaluate the way uh, we practice in um, we uh, we we um, take care of our patients and it allows us to update practice. So, although evidence-based medicine um, takes into consideration significantly research evidence, uh, evidence-based medicine, if I must say, is not about critical appraisal of evidence. It's not about the critical appraisal of evidence. It's not about the evidence is not about the studies only it's about how you adopt those evidence into your patient care it's about how you adopt those evidence and you are able to incorporate it with your patient values and your own clinical expertise so the other component which is clinical expertise which we need to also um, um, throw light upon is that um, clinical expertise comes along when we combine our clinical experience and knowledge and we're able to apply it to the individual patient's uh, circumstances and clinical expertise when we're talking about clinical expertise uh, we're not talking uh, we're not saying the same thing as clinical experience 
clinical experience is fine. It comes along with our practices along the years. But when we mean clinical expertise, we mean the combination of our experience and our up-to-date knowledge or skills and our ability to apply that to the patient's circumstances. So, and that is what evidence-based medicine requires us to bring into the practice when we're taking care of our patients. And in order to, um, um, just an emphasis on, uh, for us to be able to differentiate between clinical experience and expertise, and why it is important for us to update our knowledge, um, this is a uh, cited study, uh, or a, a systematic review, that clearly identifies how clinical experience does not really um, interpret to, uh, to, to better performance. And so um, patient value, which is the third important component of evidence-based medicine, um, patient value is critical to healthcare system without all patients, like I said earlier on, without all patients being willing to take part in the care, then the, 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 the whatever care is suggested would not uh, be effective. So patient value is, 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 um, is imperative in clinical practice. And, um, <coughs> sorry. And so it is important that as clinicians or as healthcare providers who are involved in the care of patients that we consider every circumstance surrounding our patients. And evidence-based medicine, although it says evidence-based medicine and it's easy for us to think that evidence-based medicine means the use of evidence, but it's, it clearly does not mean just the use of evidence. It starts and ends with our patient. It means the use of evidence appropriately uh, and by taking into consideration um, the unique circumstances of each patient that is being, uh, the, that whatever intervention is being carried out upon. So uh, we know that each patient has their own unique circumstances. Um, the expectation of a patient will be different from another expectation of, the uh, of another patient. A patient might want, one patient might want um, an intervention. We shouldn't use a one size fits all to treat our patient. I know we do this in practice, um, especially those that are very experienced amongst us. We, we know the value of our patient being involved. So, but, so I want to make emphasis to maybe the younger generations who might be very, very enthusiastic about the knowledge that the knowledge they have been impacted upon in school doing their undergraduate training and think that that is the most relevant aspect of um, health care. Um, the patient is the main, um, the main, the main uh, reason we're carrying out um, this intervention. And so whatever the patient requires is what we as practitioners need to aspire to be. So a, a, a patient, patients differ in whatever circumstances. So you might have a drug that you think would work for a particular patient. Another patient might prefer an alternative, which might be less effective, but might uh, prolong their life longer. So these are the things we need to consider when we're carrying out evidence-based medicine. So in summary, evidence-based medicine means integration of three components. It means the integration of clinical uh, expertise, best research evidence, and our patient's value. And how do we, but that still really doesn't mean anything. It's, I mean, it means a lot, but that is still something that is very, very difficult to put into practice. And so, recognizing this, the founders of evidence-based medicine were able to come up with a methodology that when we go through this methodology, uh, when we apply this methodology in practice, that would help us move into the practicing of evidence-based medicine. And this methodology has been um, 
has been put together as um, as um, initially it wasn't it wasn't considered as this uh, model of uh, five A's, but it's been refined along the years, and now it's been summarized as five A's. So in practicing evidence-based medicine, we have to consider these five A's, which is that we have to ask a clinical question, we have to acquire the best evidence, we have to appraise the evidence, apply the evidence, and then assess our performance. If we are able to carry out all these five steps in practice, then we would really be practicing evidence-based medicine. So I don't know if you're still following me, because I know I did talk a lot about the origin, the evolution. So, so, so the practicality of evidence-based medicine now starts on the, at this stage, which is implementing these five A's into practice. So you have to be able to ask a clinical question, a clear clinical question that will give you clear, current evidence regarding that clinical question. And then you move on to appraise the evidence which you have derived for that clinical question, appraise this evidence, and then apply the evidence to your patient, and finally assess your performance. So we'll t I'll try and take this each step as quick as possible and browse through each of the steps so that we understand the intricacies of the steps. I know we probably are already aware about it, but just to remind us again. So the first step is that we have to ask a clinical question. Now we're moving into evidence-based practice. For every patient we see, the patient comes on with a clinical problem. So all our clinical problem, all our questions comes from the patient in evidence-based medicine. So it either comes directly by assessing the patient or it can come from our colleagues, can come from other sources. So the clinical problem, the sources of our clinical problem in evidence-based medicine comes from the patient assessment or it can come from any other sources like our colleagues when we're doing collaborative work, it can come from um, the hospital management or other kind of organization that wants to audit us. They want to know about our practices and how we are carrying out intervention on patients. So the bottom line is that the clinical problem in evidence-based medicine starts with the patient. And when we have the patient, we have assessed our patient, we recognize our clinical problem. In order for us to be able to find appropriate answers that we address this clinical problem, we have to be able to define this clinical problem into what we call clear, relevant, searchable questions. And this clear, relevant, searchable questions has two arms to it. We have the background questions and we have the foreground questions. The background questions are questions that come from clinical problems, they are general questions. They are questions that come with our knowledge from school, they are general questions about the medical condition of a, um, of a patient. So these questions are questions that we can easily answer by review articles, looking at our textbook. So if they are questions that answer the why, the what, the when, the how, about a disease condition, or about a treatment. So the background questions are general questions. And then the second aspect, we start with the background questions and then we move to the foreground questions. The foreground questions now deal directly with our patients. It has to do directly with our patients. So any other management or intervention that is related directly to the patient are known as foreground questions. And these questions are based the best answered or the evidences for these questions can be best found in clinical research studies. So uh, um, I hope I'm making a bit of sense there. So in moving into evidence-based medicine practice now, we have to start with a clear clinical question for every clinical problem. And with every clinical problem, when we're defining the question, we have to identify our background questions, we have to identify our foreground questions. And our background questions are those questions that are very general questions. And the foreground questions are now questions that are specific to those patients. And those answers, we do not find them in textbook. We do not find the relevant answers, the relevant evidences 
that would support um, those questions. We do not find them in textbooks. Ideally, they must be, um, they must, they must be, um, the answers to the foreground questions must be derived from best research, medical research in the literature. And these foreground questions uh, that are specific to the uh, patients have been classified into the different categories of our care. And these are questions that have to do directly with the screening of the patient, the clinical diagnosis of the patient, the management options we have for the patient, and the prognosis of the patient. So when we are able to identify those questions, then we can go on and find the best evidences that match those questions. So as clinicians or healthcare professionals, it is um, by default that we would always have foreground knowledge, we have background knowledge. The background knowledge, which has to do with the general questions, is something that we begin to get used to and we get familiar with as our experiences in that medical condition extend over the years. So you might start uh, as an undergrad, uh, graduating, uh, as a fresh graduate, a fresh, fresh pharmacy's graduate would require a lot of background knowledge because they are just getting into the practice. But someone who is experienced like 10, 20 years will require less of the background knowledge. But because we are becoming more specialized in that field, will require more foreground knowledge, will require to uh, refine our questions to more foreground questions that are specific to the patient. So foreground knowledge and our background knowledge changes as we get more experiences with the medical condition. And for these questions, like we said earlier on, um, if we're going to find our best current evidence to, uh, to, 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 to fill in our knowledge for these two questions, then we have to be able to formulate appropriate questions that matches each of these um, areas. And so, all right, uh, of course, in clinical practice, it is, uh, uh, we have uh, different cases scenario. It's either we require uh, the information for our patients that we're able to access easily, or the information will not be readily available. And so this is where also the PICO model comes into place. PICO is a model that would now help us to formulate our foreground questions into, into a clear format so that we can uh, search for appropriate evidence that would answer those questions. So the PICO model applies to questions or knowledge that we want to um, we want to use in, uh, for the intervention of our patients directly. So PICO is not applicable for us to, uh, it might, you might use it, but that is not what it's been, um, it's been uh, created for. It's not created for us to be able to search for general knowledge. It might be effective, it might be useful, but the actual um, feature of P the PICO model is for us to be able to uh, create or formulate clear clinical questions, which are also known as the foreground questions. And these foreground questions are also known as questions that deal directly with our patients, that has to do directly with the interventions we're giving our patients. So this PICO model is population. Um, it's a mnemonic uh, that has been put together for population, P means population or patient or the problem we're trying to solve and I means the intervention we're trying to make. The intervention can be in form of therapy, prognosis, uh, diagnosis and C means comparative, the comparator. What are we trying to compare with our own intervention and O means outcomes. Outcomes, that is what we're expecting to get from that intervention. And then TT, these are other extra um, factors that we, we build when you're actually doing the research, uh, when you're actually searching for the evidence. The first T means what type of question are we asking? Like we said earlier on, the foreground question 
uh, addresses specific intervention for the patient. And it could either be for screening, diagnosis, prognosis, harm, or etiology. And then the second C means the type of study you want to find. Because each of these questions, there are different studies that would answer these questions appropriately. There are different kinds of studies that are best suited for each of these type of questions. So in summary, PICO means population or the patient or the problem we're trying to um, um, intervene. And the I means intervention, C is the comparator and O is the outcome. And so we have an hypothetical case scenario. I just put up this uh, case for the purpose of this presentation. It wasn't gotten from any textbook or from any real life case study. So that is why it's been, um, it's been identified as an hypothetical um, case um, scenario. So I don't know if I have time to just browse through quickly this case study. So this case study is um, a case of Mrs. O, a 65 year old who was brought in by ambulance and admitted to the medical ward about four hours ago. Her presenting complaint was becoming heavy and chest pain. With a history of presenting complaint of uh, on and off headaches for, for some weeks, and occasionally the headaches had been relieved by uh, paracetamol, but currently she wasn't getting any relief from that. The past history of this patient says that this patient has rheumatoid arthritis and the blood pressure of um, elevated blood pressure five years ago that was treated and uh, not having to take any medications further. Uh, the social history of this patient says that she's a non-smoker, no alcohol, a family history. Her father uh, was hypertensive for two decades before he passed away. Um, so the vital signs or objective values of this patient um, are as follows. Her vitals, uh, have vitals, her blood, pre blood pressure was 150 over 100 milli millimeter per, per mercury. Heart rate was 70. Her body mass index 30 kilometer, um, kilogram, sorry, 30 kilogram per meter square. Urea, electrolyte and other chemistry and other review of um, the system were actually fine. Um, so this patient was placed on um, amlodipine, five milligram, aspirin 150, uh, or, or clopidogrel by the healthcare practitioner uh, for control of the blood pressure and a long, uh, long term prevention of complication and to continue previous medication on that of bacrophenate, which is used for uh, uh, the patient's rheumatoid arthritis. And the working diagnosis for this patient after assessment is by, by, by the uh, physician is uh, first stage hypertension. So as a pharmacist, our goal will be to, um, our own assessment of pharmaceutical care plan for this patient will be to ensure the optimum efficacy and um, minimal adverse reaction of medications to enable the patient to be able to adhere and control the patient's blood pressure in order to prevent or delay complication. And so as pharmacists, we'll go through what our um, potential and actual drug therapy problem is. Follow up this patient with counseling and medication reconciliation on discharge. But the focus of today is not to review this case study for drug therapy problems. The uh, focus of today is to see how we can now bring in evidence-based medicine while we are carrying out our assessment and pharmaceutical care plan for this patient. So for this hypothetical case scenario now, so going back to our five A's in applying our uh, uh, evidence-based medicine practice, the first A is asking the clinical question. So we have to now, uh, ident the, the patient's condition has been identified as hypertension. So we have to develop our clear clinical question, which is the back, starting with the background question, and then we go forward to ask the foreground question. So what will the background questions be for this patient? The background questions will include general questions, our understanding of the general questions, 
So for example, now what is hypertension? What causes hypertension? What are the complications of hypertension? How is hypertension managed? So those are general knowledge that we can find in books and from our experience. And then we now go on further to identify the four grand questions and then formulate our clear clinical question from this four grand question in order to be able to go on to the next step of the evidence-based medicine model, which is now acquiring the evidence in order to answer this question. So for the four grand question, we said the adequate way or the, the recommended way is to use the PICO model. So the PICO model for this patient, the P, which is patient population or the problem, um, here will be for uh, would be the 65 year old, which is the demography of the patient, and the condition that we are trying to intervene, which is hypertension, and the intervention. That, for example, now I'm just using this as an example. You have other um, interventions that have been listed for this patient. Now, for example, we want to look at intervention for aspirin, and then uh, compare with clopidogrel. Remember, in our case, that the, the physician recommended aspirin or clopidogrel, and wants our own intervention as pharmacists to come in now. So it's easy for us to go into books and say, oh, I have a knowledge, aspirin is better than clopidogrel. But then what is the evidence that you're using to support this knowledge? Because you have to have an ex uh, evidence that says, that tells you whether aspirin will be better or clopidogrel. Based on your own clinical expertise, after years of years and years of, um, of uh, practice, you might be used to the different intervention between aspirin and clopidogrel, but then you have to be able to update yourself because as we realize, as we know, um, clinical practice changes every day. So aspirin will be the intervention, clopidogrel will be our comparison and the outcome would be, uh, what do we want to use aspirin or clopidogrel for? for? From our background knowledge, we would know that aspirin or clopidogrel is used to prevent stroke or to prevent myocardial infarction. And from experience, we, we all probably would know that. But for a fresh student who has just graduated, the, uh, the student might not know that. So the student will be required to, or the, someone who is not as experienced, will be required to find out those information from their background knowledge. So going forward, after getting our PICO formula clearly defined for each category, clearly stated, we can now merge this into a proper question. So you can see now how easier it would be for us to formulate this program question. So for PICO, uh, for population, we have the age of the patient, it's better to have a clear characteristics of this patient or the population you want to check the evidence for and then we have our intervention we have our comparator and we have the outcome so outcome like we said before can be different outcome why do we want to use this intervention do we want to use it for therapy prognosis or um, are we trying to see how harmful this intervention would be so whatever we're trying whatever effects we are expecting from the outcome will be the O. and so with that said, and the components broken down, I, I, I was able to put together this uh, foreground question for this patient. So you can now have it as in all the hypertensive patients will, you remember from our foreground question, we would have learned that aspirin or clopidogrel is an antiplatelet. So we can either say in all the hypertensive patients, will an antiplatelet prevent primary or first stroke? From our case study, we know that this patient has never had a stroke before. So that would be a first stroke. A first stroke is different from a second stroke. So the outcome we're looking for this patient, is it a first stroke, is it a second stroke, or are we trying to prevent mortality? So it depends on the outcome we're trying to see for this patient. So another way, so it's, um, PICO is a model and is a standard. It's, it's not 
uh, you cannot have the same questions formulated by every individual, but the questions that are formulated by each individual clinician or practitioners will be similar. So I've used another example again now to see how similar, using these people, how similar these questions will come up as. So the second one is that in older patients with hypertension, is aspirin effective in preventing stroke when compared to clopidogrel? You see, those are two different kind of, they are not the same word for word, but they, the two questions, they, they both, um, they both, um, the two questions both, um, they're both suited for the foreground questions. They both achieve our aim. And then another way you could put it is that, you know, older patients can also be described as elderly patients. So this 65-year-old uh, patient who is a female is being described in this situation as an elderly patient. You might decide to even put the age of the patient in your question. You might decide to go for the stage of uh, maturity or you might even include the characteristics of the patient in terms of gender. So, uh, so in, instead of saying in older patients, you can now say in elderly patients newly diagnosed with hypertension, does uh, adding aspirin or clopidogrel treatment for prevention of stroke worth the risk of bleeding? So um, what this process has shown us is how to define our clear questions. So with this four grand questions clearly defined, it's now easier for us now to go into the literature to find evidences that would clearly answer these questions that have been formulated. So following the formulation of the question, the next stage we go on to is now to acquire the best evidence that would answer this question that has been formulated. So this is an illustration of um, how you can carry out the search in the literature. So from the first step, which is the clinical problem, and then you define your important searchable question, which is asking the question, like we said earlier on. And then the next stage is for you to select the resources where you want to identify your evidences from. And there are now different databases where you can do carry out your searches in order to identify your um, uh, evidences. With this, um, with this outline here, with this flow chart here, it would be easier for you because clinicians don't have enough time to search all the information that's out there. So with this uh, flow chart that has been presented, um, this will be easy for us to just go now to go into the literature and find the adequate resource, adequate um, evidence that would answer the clinical questions that we're trying to uh, find our answers to. So, once we select our uh, likely resource, the next thing is that we now design a research, we design a search strategy. How we design this, design this search strategy is that we use the components of PICO, which we have derived earlier on, to form a combination of keywords. So the breakdown of PICO earlier on, you know, we had the patient, the intervention, the components, and the, um, the, the comparison, sorry, and the outcome. So each of the components there would be used here to design our search strategy. So we can, I mean, to, to make those search, um, those components more effective, we use what we call the uh, database language. And this is what um, we now use to combine our components, our PICO. Database languages are what allows you to be able to search precisely for the information you're using. So we have the Boolean search, which is the use of uh, the word and, or um, nods, or asterisks or brackets and you use that with each of the components to form a proper 
combination of keywords which you can now enter into your database. So, but um, this is quite another topic on its own, so I wouldn't go too far into it, but I'm sure most of us are aware of it, but we might try it out on our, in our spare time. So, once we have this combination of keywords, we can now enter that on the um, database that we have selected or that we have access to. And once we get, uh, we, 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 uh, we conduct our search, and we get our evidences, we can now go on to the next step, which is to appraise the evidence. So, but like I said earlier on, in order for us to be able to set, get the right evidence for our clinical questions, there are some preferred type of studies that are considered for specific type of question. So for example, if you want to answer questions on therapy, treatment, you have to look at studies like double-blind randomized control trials, uh, systematic review, and for diagnosis, you have to uh, similar kind of studies. But when you look at uh, questions that uh, have to do with um, looking at whether a therapy would be harmful, then cohort studies are basically the best kind of studies. Because with randomized control trials, it's possible that you are not able to see uh, long-term long -term side effects. So a cohort study would be more appropriate to answer questions that, um, uh, that have to do with the, uh, the harm a drug can cause or the, cost of, uh, the causes of all these factors of the disease. So Dr. Benny will be coming on later on to discuss more about the types of the studies we have in medical research and to shed more light on the characteristics of this um, studies. But before he comes in, um, um, let me just quickly highlight some of the, uh, um, some of the evidence-based database that we can use for our searches. Um, there's um, some free evidence-based uh, databases that have been listed here. Um, and there's um, on, on, on our left side, there's a table, a small table there. There's some evidence-based medicine databases that we can use um, later on. And also on the right side, it does highlight that some of these databases were actually created after evidence-based medicine, the concept of evidence-based medicine came into existence. So it also goes to show um, the changes that has happened after evidence-based medicine uh, came into existence. Because evidence-based medicine came into existence in the 80s and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was refined better in the 90s and after it became a bit more refined, some of these big databases started coming up, like the PubMed, the Cochrane, and um, some evidence-based medicine centers. So those are part of the impact of the concept of evidence-based medicine itself. And so, for every research evidence uh, um, that we require to answer our clinical questions appropriately, this research evidence is have been categorized into different levels or different uh, hierarchy. And this hierarchy of evidence kinds of represents the quality of um, the medical researches. And the higher we go in this level of evidence, the higher the quality of the evidences are supposed to be. But then the higher we go, the likely we are the likely we are uh, we are we're going to find less studies. So we might be aiming for systematic reviews, we might be aiming for our cities, but we might not be able to find those, those evidences and we might have to do with case control or case, uh, case series, which are lower. So that is the reality we have in practice. We all want systematic review, we want our cities, but the reality is that we might not have um, enough evidence at those level. So whatever evidence you have will be what you will now be able to utilize to match um, um, your clinical um, 
your clinical questions. So the, the, uh, this will be covered further by Dr. Agbeni um, later. And it's the third step of carrying out evidence-based medicine practice. Uh, which is the appraisal of the evidence. So once you are able to validate whether your evidence is suitable and you're able to see that this evidence uh, um, has shown enough effect and is applicable to your patient, then you can go on and apply this um, evidence. Um, but before he comes up, can I just also say quickly that on the top of this uh, level of evidence, we have the, uh, what we call the evidence-based clinical guidelines. And evidence-based clinical guidelines erupted more after evidence-based medicine practice came into existence. Uh, a well-developed evidence-based clinical guideline ideally will be on the top of the hierarchy. And the beauty of this is that it, has, it does help practitioners to get access to current evidence. However, despite the fact that evidence-based clinical practices are very common, they have their limitations. And their limitations are what has been obviously stated there. They might not answer to each of our uh, patients what we want for each patient. And they can be biased, biased to, to, to the organization that is uh, producing this evidence and they, they might not be as current as what we want. So even if we have access to clinical guidelines, we still have to be able to appraise the individual studies because these systematic reviews and these guidelines might not be suitable for our patients. So, um, Doctor, I would like to invite Dr. Abeni now to, uh, to, uh, to briefly uh, cover the hierarchy of evidence. Thank you very much. And once he's done, I'll just spend about five, ten minutes to finish the rest of the presentation. Thank you.